Hello, welcome back to my haunted library. It's Regina. So today I have book two in the Doll and Ganger series and I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. And like my other reviews on this series, there will be spoilers, so just a warning. So book two, Petals on the Wind by V.C. Andrews is the follow-up to the extremely popular Flowers in the Attic that came out in 1979. And this was published soon after in 1980 and this book even more than the first book has a kind of a salaciousness about it that honestly had me laughing throughout most of it and I've said before I really love camp and this one really goes all the way when I say camp I mean like a soap opera-ish kind of drama that is so over the top you just have to laugh it, it's still considered gothic horror, although the horror elements are really not in this book as much. Some gothic elements, especially towards the end, but it's more like a soap opera as far as like, um, it could be titled The uh, Seductions of Kathy Dollinganger, because that's really what this book is about. A teenage Kathy seduces everyone in sight, and she really can't help it because she's so stunning and so alluring that the men just can't help themselves, whether it's her 40-year-old uh, <laughs> caretaker or her, you know, older brother. Doesn't matter. Anyway, or her mother's husband. She's everywhere in this book, and it's really, really kind of amusing. So uh, at the end of Flowers in the Attic, after little Corey had died, they, uh, the, the, the remainder of the Dollinganger children escape Foxworth Hall, Chris, Kathy, and little Carrie. So uh, Carrie, poor Carrie, has uh, some physical disabilities because she, during her growing years, was in the attic and she didn't get enough sunlight, she didn't get good nutrition, and she is uh, not growing. So she's very uh, small for her age and and although she has a beautiful face, her body didn't develop and she's very self-conscious about it. And she's kind of like an Im immature in a way too, and, and, and an innocent. So Chris and Kathy are on, with Carrie, are on a bus, Greyhound bus heading south to Florida when they run into an African-American uh, mute, I think she is, woman named Henny. Henny sees what's going on with the kid. She knows something's wrong. Carrie's very sick, has a high fever. So she brings them back to her home where she works as a maid and like live in companion to uh, Dr. Paul Sheffield, a middle-aged, very handsome middle-aged widow doctor. The children move in with him and uh, it's kind of a strange arrangement because Kathy is constantly trying to seduce him, running around in her little um, baby doll pajamas and sitting on his lap. And uh, eventually he does succumb, as every man does to Kathy's charms. So in the course of this book, she's uh, in love with Dr. Dr. Paul, who's like a surrogate father, so there's that. Her brother Chris, of course, let's not forget him. In fact, in the book it's kind of, maybe not confirmed, but she is pregnant with Chris's baby, she believes, because uh, she starts studying ballet and during, I think it might be during one of the performances. Of course it's a performance because it has to be the most dramatic <laughs> possible situation. She has this terrible miscarriage and you know, she confesses to Dr. Paul about her and Chris. And he's very, very understanding about it. So she's trying to put all of this stuff behind her and allows herself to get swept into another romance with a ballet dancer named Julian Marquet. And his mother is like a grand dame of the ballet and Kathy's studying with them. And Julian is very insistent that they become like a world-class dance couple. So Kathy enters the world of professional ballet, which is not really that believable considering the fact that she only self-trained in an attic. I don't know. The, the little bit of suspension of disbelief in several parts of this uh, story, but we won't let that hold us back. So uh, Julian, the ballet dancer, is very, whom she marries and, and immediately regrets it, is very controlling. He's um, a, a very cruel lover. And the whole time, poor Chris, the brother, is just mooning over Kathy. 
he he has a few affairs. He goes to medical school, but he's just kind of always there. Like now, she does uh, hook up with Doctor Paul at some point. I forget when because she's sitting on his lap in her little shorty nightgown, and he just can't take it anymore. So Julian, who's this wild man, um, is driving his sports car and is killed in a car accident. And Kathy is pregnant with his child. So she has the first of her children, and that's Jory, Julian's son. Now, Jory will end up being a very important part of the whole Dollinganger epic, which her other son will too. So Kathy is being very impulsive throughout all of this stuff. I mean, she's really just kind of going by her hormones and the fact that every man who fall, you know, falls immediately in love with her. And... The way it's described in, in the book, I mean, she's just physically perfect with her long blonde hair, her Dresden doll face, her incredible body, you know, toned by her ballet lessons and her big blue eyes. And I think, I think that's part of the appeal of this book is, is the, the fantasy aspect of the, you know, the perfect female, the perfect girl, although her personality is not perfect, but throughout the series, she does grow. But in this book, she's really kind of, uh, not the best heroine in the world in that she's doesn't seem to care um, whom she hurts, but in a way she realizes, and this is the strength of the book, that she is a lot like her mother, Corinne, after all. In fact, she is the spitting image of a young Corinne. There's a whole subplot with Carrie too, where Carrie is sent to a girl's school and the girls torture her in like a scene from Jane Eyre. And I noticed in these uh while reading the whole series, I see a lot of like Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights, different Gothic classics in, in this book, kind of forming the foundation of it, uh, some of the plot. But she goes back and she never really can get her life together when she grows up. She does uh, get engaged to like a preacher's son, but she doesn't go through with it. And it's really sad. She ends up uh, committing suicide with arsenic laced donuts, exactly like her mother gave her because she believes inside that she's worthless. And when this happens and when they lose Carrie, uh, Christopher is more stoic. You know, he does become a doctor and, and his advice to Kathy is just like, you know, forget about the past, move on, but move on with me because I'm in love with you. And I'm the only man who will ever really love you in this way. She's very ambivalent about Christopher in this book. What happens to Carrie only strengthens Kathy's revenge. So she and Christopher, I think he just follows her there. He just follows her throughout the whole book. You know, when she's on in the ballet tour, he's there, you know, looking pathetic and just, you know, just follows her around, just hoping that she'll love him again. And she moves to Virginia back to uh, where Foxworth Hall is in that little town and this whole time she's been writing her mother these very mean letters, kind of threatening and saying, you know, how does it feel to kill your children? How does it feel to uh, put your children in the attic? And Corinne never answers her. But she catches glimpses of Corinne's life, like in the society pages and seeing her in town. And she notices, and I, to me, this is also like really campy. She's married to Bart Winslow, who's a little younger than Corinne. And Corinne's starting to show her age and Bart is still like this hot, you know, lawyer and Corinne's starting to get like some, you know, she's getting a little facelift. She's going to a, a you know, a fat farm because she's trying to get her, keep herself together. And Kathy, as her mother's beauty is fading, Kathy is just getting stronger and stronger in her beauty and her youthful seductiveness. So Kathy plots her revenge by seducing her mother's husband, Bart Winslow, who is this hot young lawyer in the town and yeah they start this affair and she's living in this little uh house near foxworth hall she's raising a uh, jewelry chris is kind of hanging around hoping that she'll change her mind and just run off with him and she becomes pregnant with bart's child who then uh in in subsequent books becomes very important very important character so uh the whole thing comes to a climax, a dramatic climax, and kind of like a Daphne du Maurier, Rebecca's uh, little echoes of that. Like I said, there, there are a lot of tropes from other Gothic book, uh, classics in this book. And, and that's also a very enjoyable part of the story, I must say. So there's this big Christmas ball at Foxworth Hall, and 
the key that Christopher carved back in the day still works. Oh, go figure. Still works in the back door. So uh, Kathy sneaks in. She revisits the attic where they were held captive. She uh, goes into her mother's closet and, and sees all her beautiful clothes and her furs. And she puts on one of Corinne's old gowns. And during the climax of the ball, she comes down the stairs looking exactly like Corinne. So uh, in the TV movie, the Lifetime movie, uh, which is great, they're all great. Uh, Olivia, the grandmother, is played by Ellen Burstyn. And she is one of the best actresses on the planet. And she really does an amazing job. And Heather Graham is not like the best actress, but she's... She plays like kind of like an airhead Corinne, which kind of works for the character. And the whole series is really fun. So um, during the Christmas party, Corinne is being... Um, oh, and Chris, Chris shows up, of course. During the Christmas party, Corinne is now being confronted by the truth of her life, all of her lies, what she did to, uh, to destroy her children, the death of uh, Carrie and uh, Corey and she just has a complete like breakdown and collapse and she thinks Christopher is Chris her husband like the one you know the, the children's father everything goes crazy and Corinne ends up setting Foxworth Hall on fire so at the end of the story Olivia and uh, Bart Winslow uh, Corinne's husband, die in the fire at Foxworth Hall. Corinne ends up in a mental hospital. Uh, Dr. Paul dies from a heart attack. I think Henny dies or has a stroke or something. So there's nothing keeping them here. Uh, Chris finally convinces Kathy, let's just run away together. We'll uh, take on Dr. Paul's kind of name and identity and we'll move far away to California with little Jory, and the son that you're carrying, or the child you're carrying, they don't know what it is yet, uh, Bart. The petals are scattered now from the flowers. And I have to say, I really enjoyed this one. Of all five books, this is one of my favorites. So let me know in the comments below if you have uh, read any of these books. And uh, yeah, and on to the next one, which I will do a video for soon. So that's all I have for today. Thanks for stopping by my haunted library and I'll see you soon. Bye.